Haribo. I'm feeling real good right now, you know. Just like I feel good, you know. I'll be chanting and stuff, and I'll be getting these good feelings, right? So anyway, about I don't have no particular subject for this video. I just want to kick it. I might name this video "Let's Kick It" Vice Nava Style. Just kick it, cause Prabhupada said. Yeah, I'm always saying Prabhupada said. But if I say Prabhupada said, you could go look it up. I'm not like one of them dudes who be like Prabhupada said your wife should come with me and na 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 na. If I say Prabhupada said, I read it somewhere. And if you just Google what I say Prabhupada said, you'll find it somewhere that he said that. So, with that said. Prabhupada said, in reference to like, you know, fighting or getting into debates or any kind of um situation where you're dealing with aggressive entities, right? Basically, Prabhupada says that you don't punch a skunk with your hands or else your hands is going to stink. You kick a skunk. You kick a skunk with your foot. You just kick it, kick it away. In the East, you know, the feet. It's very interesting because, like, they have a transcendental foot fetish in India. Like, everything is about the lotus feet of my spiritual master, the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. Everything is the foot, foot. They're really foot worshippers in the East, right? And it's funny because at the same note, as holy as the foot is considered, right? Like, when you're sitting in the temple, you're not supposed to point your feet towards the deities. And I remember even when I was in Islam, you wasn't supposed to point your feet at people, period. You know, they... People in Islam take it as disrespect if you point your feet at them or you point your shoes. That's why to us, when the guy threw the shoe at President Bush, it was kind of funny to Americans. But people in the East would have took that as a very, very big insult that somebody threw their shoe. <clears throat> so in one aspect, the foot is holy. The foot is everything because the foot connects you to the ground. That's the, that's the, the, the place where the spirit meets the earth. Where Krishna's feet touch this planet, that's where spirit meets the earth, this material world. So everybody wants to worship his feet. And at the same time, the feet are an object of scorn if those feet do not belong to an advanced, devoted, or exalted personality. So the feet will, will bring scorn if pointed at you. Another thing to learn when showing proper etiquette, when I was working at LaGuardia Marriott, you can add this to my resume. I started there around 1998, and my last day working there was about... One day, <coughs> excuse me, one day after 9-11. And what I saw was like some dudes, I don't know if they were some Bangladesh or Bengal, they were short Indian dark-skinned men. And they came, this guy came and like he looked, he looked like he was clean and stuff. His, his clothes was clean, like he had an iron at home. He was well-pressed, you know, well taken care of, older gentleman of distinguished character. And a man came up to him. And basically touched his feet. Like he, I think he kissed his hands. Then he touched both sides of his feet. I was like, oh, so that's how they pay respects. So now studying Krishna consciousness, I find out that respect, obeisances begin at the feet. And blessings begin at the head. So if like you're an exalted personality and somebody comes up to you and touches your feet, right? Sometimes people are either trying to steal your shakti. Or they're trying to dump off some of your sins. So how do you balance out that energy? Somebody's either trying to steal my energy by touching my feet. Or they're trying to dump off some of their sins. Simple. You touch their head. Remember, respect begins at the feet. Blessings begin at the head. It's just like when you bow down in the temple. I think I mentioned this in one of my videos before. But like the process of yoga that we do is bhakti yoga. So people come to our temples and be like, yo, all I saw y'all doing was dancing. Singing, you had this plant. I didn't know if it was like Ralph, the head of lettuce, or but I saw y'all walking around this plant and, and giving her water and singing to this plant and burning incense for a plant. And that's all I saw. And I saw y'all looking at some deities and singing. And I saw some people crying, some people dancing, some people were just there in a the stupor, just looking like the deity was talking to them. But I, I y'all said y'all are Hindus or, or Vedic people. Where's the yoga at? Like, I didn't see nobody putting it. Their foot behind their head or nothing like that. Well, in this process, Srila Prabhupada is such a genius that everything he had us doing was a part of the yoga perfectional process. For example, I've seen an, a very elderly lady who's, who might be older than my grandmother who's approaching 90. She bent down and you know how like when Muslims prostrate, they make salat, they put their head to the floor. 
She does that easily. Old, old lady. She can barely walk, but she can get in that temple, get on the floor. She can sit in Indian style perfectly and all of that good stuff. It's because you keep your body limber when you are actively engaging your body in the service of Krishna. By bowing down and touching the floor to your head, you actually ground yourself out. That's a form of grounding. People in the computer world would know what I'm talking about because when you open up a computer case, you should have an ESD wrist strap, electrostatic discharge wrist strap. Because remember, even when you touch something and there's um, static electricity, just that small amount of static electricity can fry your microcircuits. So you have to have this ESD device which it basically puts your body at the same charge as the computer case so there's no more energy transfer there's no uh violence there's no spark you know so <clears throat> you ground yourself out just like dr york taught us back in the days he was like if you ever go to mother africa make sure you take off your shoes and walk on the soil of africa with your bare feet at least once because that will recharge you that will get you in tune with the magnetic you know he had a lot of elaborate explanations but you get the gist Something good happens when you ground yourself, when you touch the floor with your face, with your hands, with your feet, when you become, so to speak, one with nature, or you become in harmony with nature. So I'd also like to say don't ever debate with the Hare Krishna devotees because because they are chanting so much, you don't people might not realize this, but those people are super intelligent. What happens is the more you chant, it's been scientifically proven the more brain connections you start having your neurons, axons, there's so many words, so many scientific definitions for what's going on in the brain. But scientists used to teach you that your brain doesn't grow once you lose brain cells, you don't replace them. That is a fallacy. As a matter of fact, if you drink pure milk, and I don't mean the organic milk you buy in the stores, that ain't pure. As long as the cow is feeling fair, she is going to emit pus and adrenaline, which means it is not healthy milk. Even if it doesn't have any antibiotics or GMO or Monsanto or Frankenstein parts in it. Even if it's a pure cow raised in a pure environment, as long as it feels like somebody's going to kill me one day as soon as I stop giving milk. Or if you kidnap her babies from her, just like you do to any other woman, she's not going to function properly. And the chemical imbalance then begins in her brain as a result of negative emotions. So once again, if you get pure cow's milk, Srila Prabhupada teaches, and yes, Hare Krishna, we are vegetarians, or should I say procedarians, but we don't indulge ourselves in no animal products except for the byproducts of the cow which can be obtained non-violently keyword non-violently we're not going to take their babies away so she's happy she feeds her baby first then she gives us excess milk that she would have gave the farmer okay she knows she's going to die of old age she's going to see krishna when she died or she's going to take human birth but really it's better for them to just go back to krishna i wouldn't recommend you becoming a human oh mother cow and ain't worth it. <laughs> Remember, cow, you were automatically born in the mode of goodness or sattva gunna. But us humans, oh man, we be born in raja gunna, which is the mode of passion or anxiety, and in, with a little tamo gunna mixed in, which is the mode of ignorance. And boy, are we ignorant right now as a human species. So, <clears throat> you get that pure milk, and it gives you the animal fats that your body needs. How do you know that you need animal fats? Because you have canine teeth. If you didn't have incisors in your mouth, then you would have teeth like a hippopotamus or a horse or a cow. Flat teeth. Good for chewing grass and gum. All right? No, we don't just have flat teeth. We have mostly flat teeth with sharp edges right here. Incisors here. Canines. All right? So we don't just have molar teeth. We need animal flesh, which is why under certain time, places, and circumstances, like a lot of people will ask, well, if Jesus was such a vice novel, or if he was such an exalted follower of God, why did he say when he come down off the mountain, oh, I am hungry, I need meat, or something like give me some fish or something. He was feeding people a whole bunch of fish. Truth is the environment, everything's time and place and circumstance. Just like if I'm a Hare Krishna, but I move to Alaska, <clears throat> or better yet, if I move to the Arctic Circle, and I'm teaching Hare Krishna to the Eskimos up there, guess what I'm going to be eating? Salmon, reindeer meat, lichen. The only, what, 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 what I'm going to offer Krishna? Some moss that grows on rocks? All right, I'll offer him that because he likes it. He said, give me a leaf, give me a water, fruit, whatever. But ain't too much fruits up there. So once again, 
You're in a dilemma according to time, place, and circumstance. If you're from Galilee, Judea, those areas in the Mesopotamian area, for some reason, Judea is like a rocky, arid climate. So these people are coming from a wilderness, arid, desert environment. If you live in the desert, you got to eat meat. So I hope that clears that up. If Jesus was around today and he was in America, he would not be eating at McDonald's or Ben's Deli or none of that crazy stuff. He'd be a prasadam eating person. Trust me, when Jesus went to India, they wasn't giving him no 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 cow parts to eat. You know, he wasn't telling them, hey, I'm Hebrew. You know, Leviticus, law of Leviticus says just drain the blood and cut it with a sharp knife and say Shabbat Shalom or something like that. No, 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 it don't work like that. All right? Kosher standards is way higher than, I mean, Prashadam standards are way higher than kosher standards because once the spirit soul leaves the body, the body becomes a house. It's already a house of bacteria, viruses, and pus, and all of that stuff. But then they be the, the putrefaction begins. They begin to putrefy. So once again, bringing it back to the milk, if you drink pure milk, hot with spices, it will build something called finer brain material. You'll be able to understand higher concepts and speak on higher concepts, and most importantly, live higher concepts. There were some things I wanted to, t oh, bam, check this out, right? Hanuman is still on the planet. Some of his associates are still on the planet. They came around in Treta Yuga, which was about 1.7 million years ago. But Hanuman is still here. I'm not going to go into the story why he's here. But why am I bringing that up? Because it is possible to be incarnated more than once at the same time in the same place. In other words, there's an Acharya or a teacher called Madhava or Madhava Acharya. And he was known as an incarnation of Hanuman. But the only problem is, how is he going to be an incarnation of Hanuman during the age of Kali Yuga? So I think in the 1300s. So this was Kali Yuga. In, in the 1300s or 13th century, he came with this Brahma Madhavaya, Brahma Madhava Sampradaya and reestablished the Sampradaya going back 150 trillion years ago. But how could it be an expansion of Hanuman if Hanuman was still running around on the planet Earth? The truth is, the Nitya Siddhas, or eternally perfected beings, the associates of Krishna, they can actually, because of yoga, there's a mystic process of yoga where you could separate yourself into eight different people. But the Nitya Siddhas, Siddhas, the people who are eternally liberated, their powers are even more transcendental than the yoga system because apparently they could, I could still be myself. I could be another person in another body at the same time on the same planet. So this, these pastimes are amazing. It's unlimited information. I'm asking you to keep studying. You know what I mean? There's no doom and gloom here. We're not going to threaten you with hell. Whatever you're not ready to take to in this life, Krishna is merciful and he understands and you will receive other opportunities. However, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakura, which is the Guru Maharaj or the initiating guru of Srila Prabhupada, always taught, don't wait for another life. Don't wait for another life. Take advantage of this human form now. Let's look at it realistically. In my past life, I could have been a worm in stool. I could have been a swan. I could have been a pigeon. In my next life, I don't know what I'll be. I could be a tapeworm. I could be a demigod. I could be a demon. Or I could be a devotee. Or I could be a flower in the spiritual world. I could be a rock, a stone. I could be one of Krishna's friends, parents, whatever. But I don't know what I'm going to be in my next life. I'm preparing for my next life now. I understand that this life, and I'm living. You see all of this stuff? Come on, man. I didn't see none of this stuff coming. Tibetan singing bowls. I learned about that from my ex. You know what I'm saying? Tibetan singing bowls. This is a Murti of Govinda that was sent to me from a Prabhu from California. And this, my good friend of mine, my homegirl, gave me that for Christmas last year. You know what I'm saying? I get I get so much blessings. Now, first of all, when you see these things, right, you're saying, oh, these are material objects. Oh, this guy is worshipping these things. No. Anything that is used for Krishna's service falls under the line of Balaram. Just so happens that Balaram's appearance day, Prabhu Nityananda's appearance day will be on the Super Bowl. So I guess that's February 1st. That's Prabhu Nityananda's. And Prabhu Nityananda is right here. He's an expansion of Balaram. Oh, man, it's too bright for y'all, right? Okay, the one in the blue, that's Prabhu Nityananda. He's an expansion of Balaram himself. So anything used for Krishna's service is actually Balaram. Balaram has no other cause except Krishna. He's the first person 
after Krishna made his first expansion, it was there. Balaram, boom, boom. Ebony and ivory. Ebony, black, that was Krishna. Ivory, that's the white one. That's Balaram. Same person, different bodies. So I like to give everybody a shout out. Continue on with your devotion and service. Keep striving. Keep learning. And once again, go to www.asitis.com. As it is.com for more information. Hari Bola.